begin the nasty work. We're going to do the worst now. So I'm going to wash all of these. I'm going to wash all the nasty stuff. <clears throat> I'm going to also, I'm going to use bleach and this stuff. I'm going to use this stuff. I'm going to put some at the bottom. The thing is, I get really overwhelmed, but the truth is, it really only takes a little bit of time to clean all this up. It just looks worse than it is. And then if I set a timer, oh, that's what I'm going to do. If I set a timer, these are all my nasty rags. So after I'm done with all my regular laundry, I wash... Let me see. After I'm done with all my regular laundry, I wash all my nasty, like, dog beds and cleaning rags and mop rags. Although, I don't feel like I have. Okay. I don't feel like I have any more. Okay, I, I've got to, it's insanity. It's seriously, it is, it is true. I have like saved and brought home so much stuff that it's just kind of out of control at this point. And so I got to really organize and I've got to really go through stuff. So I think that's a clean mop head on my steam mop. So we're going to go ahead and do this. And this is nasty stuff. So this is like dog bedding, bathroom rugs, area rugs, cleaning stuff, nasty bathroom rags. I'm not going to run it just yet because I'm going to clean the bathroom and everything. And then I'll throw those rags in and then... Okay, so that's prepped and ready.
doing some, so I set the timer. I think I've only done about an hour and a half of cleaning. Bathroom is thoroughly cleaned and floors are swept and mopped. And I got all the laundry put away, all of it. And there was a lot. And I perched a couple boxes. Well, actually I'm on the set. I perched a huge box that's out there. So I've taken about one bag and two big boxes outside. They're on the street. Nobody seems interested. And I've got another box started. So I'm feeling, I'm picking up steam and I washed all the windows and I washed that uh, menu board over there, washed that. All the, not the windows, the mirrors. Anyway, my tuna casseroles are really easy. They're just cream mushroom tuna, noodles. I do a little pepper. And I do a little chicken bouillon, and then I'm gonna put cheese, usually cheddar's the best. And I broke the bottom of this. Oh, so I'm gonna have to find another. Oh, I'm trying to loosen it up. And I am so inspired that I'm gonna go clean out my car. Because my car is old as Moses, but I love it. But, um, also I bought some cheese. I bought these big bags of cheese on sale at Safeway, but I will never, I don't like Lucerne. I do not like Lucerne at all. I used the, uh, I made pizzas the other day and I used, um, I mean, hopefully this one will be okay, but I used, it was called a Italian cheese mix. And I thought, oh, this would be great for pizza. And it was awful. It was really, um, uh, it just had a weird flavor, no flavor, except for a weird flavor. And it wasn't chewy or gooey or anything. It was just kind of mushy and flat tasting. So I'm gonna try this mozzarella and we'll see. And hopefully this will be. But this is what I'm doing. I'm doing a couple things of, and I've got a huge bin. Every four or five days I make a huge bin of salad. You saw that in the big tub. And I just use two kinds of heads of lettuce and red cabbage or purple cabbage, I don't know why they don't call it purple, and carrots, and you can put whatever in it, but those last a long time, and it lasts about four or five days. And so we have salad every day, and then I just make one simple dish. I either make a casserole, or something in the crock pot, or I roast a chicken and potatoes and carrots, just keeping it super simple. All right, these, I wish I had never painted these. These were fine green and then the bottoms, but oh well. Wish in one hand, you know that saying. I won't repeat it. Oh gosh. I was remembering, you know, they talked about that poor squeaky clean. Because some stuff, you know, the paint's peeling and it's just kind of parts of my house are pretty funky. And so I just try to remember. I guess that's why I like to read about people like Connie Holquist, who are super poor. Because, I don't know, then you just remember to be grateful. And you're like, oh, that looks nice, see? And those stuff's still stuck to it. See, because it's kind of like, oh, and then there, look. Well, I don't know if you can really tell. But I guess I like reading about poor people because when they're grateful and they make the best of what they have, so that when we, you know, even rich people, look at rich people, some, not all, not all, please don't think I'm talking about all, 
But, you know, there are a lot of people who are pretty well off. Look at some of these billionaires and they're still not happy. They own like 12,000 chain stores and they're still buying more stuff and want more stuff. And it's like, I always use Jim Carrey because he said that one thing. He said, he retired from Hollywood and he said, I have enough, I've done enough, I am enough. And that is a real hard one, especially for humans. Actually, I wish the guy, I wish the landlord had never painted because if you peel back all this paint, I'll show you. If you peel back this paint, underneath it was kind of like a, um, like a buttery yellow. And it wasn't bad. And it was throughout the whole house. It was just a plain old kind of off yellow, like a peach yellow. And so if you peel off all the paint, you get back down to that. And that was not a bad color, but we painted over. Well, no, he, the landlord painted. It wasn't a bad color at all. It was actually a nice color. And the landlord painted over it this horrible green, like this weird pastel army green. And actually that was a nice color. I could have stayed with that. And the linoleum was fine too. Everything about the house, it was fine. The linoleum was fine. The paint color was fine. It was just an old house and it was kind of cozy. And then he painted over everything this hideous olive, like light olive army, light army green. And then we painted over it, but I didn't know enough about paint back then. Like you have to use, I think it, you guys tell me every time and I forget, but like you have to use like oil paint on water paint so it sticks or vice versa. And I didn't know. And so I brought the wrong paint. And so that paint, the white paint did not stick at all. And then I've been painting over ever since. And now we just have thick layers of, really what needs to happen is everything needs to be stripped. I'm, I need to repaint everything. Like the doors and the window sills and the door sills and the, the, um, the window and door frames and the baseboards and the doors. I need to repaint, but I'm putting it off because it's easy and it's kind of a fun job. But what really needs to happen, which my artist friend pointed out, is that everything needs to be kind of peeled and taken off to have that done right. And I don't wanna do it. I just like to paint. I don't like to, you know, get all the paint off and like, that's a whole project. That's like a big project. And if all I was doing was focusing on the house. Okay, this is the other thing I do. So anyway, these are clean and Bali already washed the windows. Although I need to come over here. I spray, I spray a lot of oil and it gets all over the window. When I'm doing my pans, spraying oil into my pans, it gets all over this window. This thing, I love this thing. I don't know why it's empty people drinking it? What's happening? I feel like I'm always feeling it. Sparkly windows. Sparkly life. Then the other thing I do, I'll show you. Here's my big old tub of salad. And I'm having my second. So the tuna casserole turned out wonderful. It was a hit. It does taste good. The cheese was okay. The noodles were wonderful. So everyone ate lots of that, but no salad. But this is my second salad. I had a little bit of the tuna. But I'm not actually in the mood for 
I don't know, but when you eat one meal a day, um, you gotta make sure that you eat enough or you wind up starving by nine o'clock. Well, we cleaned the car. I brought this big bag of, I just, I did not wash these. I did not wash these, but I shook them out. I vacuumed the whole car and I brought all my own cleaner. I brought my Windex and my homemade cleaner and all my rags. And I just thoroughly cleaned the whole car, but you know, it's an old car. So it can only look as good as it can look, but it feels good. And I can actually see out my cracked windshield. But this poor car is falling apart. The windshield wipers are falling apart. This is the worst my windshield has ever been. This is like, the I think, the second or third time we've replaced it. But we're up here in the mountains. So when I look around, like almost every car I see... There, you know, I won't show the cars, but every car I see, their windshield is cracked. It's hard up in the mountains. It's a hard life. Anyway, the car is totally clean. Clean, 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 clean. Vacuumed, and then there's all these shoes in here. And then I went to the library, and I got stacks and stacks of books. And then this cleaning, so one car wash, okay, so they have Ducky car wash, but you have to pay $11 <sighs> and get the whole car washed. This way, for $2, I clean the whole car. I bring my own cleaning solution, I use the vacuum for a dollar, I get one of the scents for a dollar, and, and that's another story. So $2, so you save, because it's about $12, so you save about $10. Plus, I don't really care about the outside of my car. I just want to be able to see out my windows, and I want the inside to be clean and fresh. You know, I can't stand it when my car's filthy. It makes me depressed. And so then I go to this car wash by our house, and you can wash and you can vacuum, but they have no car scents. Or wipes, which that's okay because I brought my own equipment. So then I go to the other car wash, which is totally shut down, but I didn't know it, so I wasted a dollar. Then I went to my husband's gas station and bought a tree for two dollars, and he yelled at me. He said, there's a cone there, and he told me that it was shut down three months ago, but I'm like, well, I thought you could still wash your car and get car scents. You just couldn't vacuum, because I'm very blonde sometimes. I'm like, I only registered part of the story. And then I was mad because the machine took my dollar. I'm like, they should put signs on things saying it's all out of order. But he says there's a cone, but you know what? I went the other way. So I walked by the cone, so I didn't see the cone. I think it's incompetent that they don't have everything shut down. So I sure took my dollar. So then my tree cost me $3 because I lost a dollar. And then I had to buy this stupid tree for $2. And it's strawberry. And it kind of smells good. It kind of smells good. But my favorite is like tropical or pina colada, which they're the same. So it smells like that, um, you know, when we were young and we'd use that coconut tropicana or whatever. Ugh. Love that smell. Anyway, my sweet old car. Look at this. Look, see, I couldn't get everything off of there. It's just, you know, it's just all worn out. Crack windshield. The lights, my headlights out. My brake lights out. My windshield wipers out. This dashboard thing doesn't work. Doesn't light up anymore. But the radio works and the car gets me from A to Z and back from Z to A. That is all I care about, but I do need lights, but I don't drive at night anyway, because anyway, I'm at the park. I'm at the park so Sam can run around. He did all his schoolwork, and um, I'm going to read. I've got my ice water. I've got gum in here and chapstick, so all my needs are met, plus I have lots of books. Look at that lovely view. Good morning to everyone. Molly had lots of breakfast. Come on, Molly. Come on, Molly. Molly, you have to go out. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. This place is locked up like. 
Ah, it's looking a little rough out here. We're not swimming or anything. Those days are over. It's actually pretty cool at night. I've thrown an extra comforter on the bed. We are now switching the seasons. And let me tell you, I just love when the seasons change. It's like we get just enough summer to be like done and okay, we're ready for fall. And then the wonderful crisp fall arrives. And I'm still freezing. I'm still harvesting and freezing tomatoes. Okay. Here's Miss Molly. Here's Miss Molly. Here's Miss Molly. Molly. We're going to take a D W A L K in a minute. But, okay, so I said that I wasn't going to bring any more free stuff home. And we're already blowing it twice. Oh, well, but I did, I had a clause. I said, I'm not going to buy anything anymore. I'm not going to bring stuff home. And, but I said, I'm only human and I am a fr lover of free things. And if I pass a box that has some really great stuff, I'm not going to pass it up. I'm only human. Plus I'm not, I'm not dumb. So I have brought some stuff home, but not much. I brought some clothing home, but actually I, yesterday I did a bunch of purging and I put like some big boxes and bags out there of stuff from us. And there were some clothes that Mariah thought that she would like, but upon looking, I'm like, you're never going to wear this. You're never going to wear these things. So let's pass it on. Um, and then I found a lot of decorative pillows. I found these beautiful lace curtains. These are in perfect condition and they are beautiful lace curtains. So these are for my kitchen window. I'm going to switch out the fruit curtains in my window and put these up, even though these are very spring. Maybe I'll save them for spring because we are going into fall and winter. So maybe I'll save them for spring. These are kind of a spring summer. Anyway, I love them. I did find a nice flannel sheet. So, and I am short on sheets. So, and I found adorable pillows. I have found all the, and I was able to wash all of them and wash the covers. And so just wonderful decorative pillows. Um, well, most of them are on another couch. Uh, let's go look at them. Also, I kind of redecorated the, I didn't re-redecorate, but I kind of, I had to put up my, I put up my fall decor. It's fall, y'all. And I cleaned this up. I had a lot of tchotchke, which I donated to the street. And I moved the couch over and put this over here because this is such a beautiful stand. It was kind of crammed in the corner. And then I have all these wonderful pillows. So the, like these, and I can't believe they wash so well. And then this cute pillow and this one. So I love how this couch looks. It's wonderful. And, and there's some more fall. And I just kind of moved the plants around. Plus I got to touch up the wall. I got to get going on these walls. I got to get going on these. I just, my friend says I should peel all this paint. I'm like, you don't even know what that would require of me. I wish, yeah, I know you do. And then this couch is all, um, I actually got all my laundry put away. This couch has all kinds of cute pillows. All of these are free. I found all of these up the street. All of them, all of them, all of them. And then this one, I love us. I, I can't, honestly, I can't stand that stuff. I love us, live, love, laugh. I used to, you know, have that, you know, I'd find those things and put them out and think that's cute. But then they became so trendy. Now I can't, but I still like the pillow and I do love us, but see, you can turn around. There you go. All right. Sammy's going to take Molly for a walk and I'm making, I'm going to take him to the library. He has worked so well on his schoolwork. I'm just really, and he's been helping me so much. So I'm going to treat him with a trip to the 
Okay, so I am making cookies for the librarians, but it's kind of a weird, I had a bunch of peanut butter left over from when we were using the food bank because I always saved it for the, it's got a lot of sugar and junk in it. So I save it for making cookies, which the junky peanut butter is great for cookies. And there's my beautiful view. I get a nice classical station on here. I just have the radio, there's no TV. And it is sometimes hard, but I just feel like it's really beneficial. I mean, we're all out doing stuff. Anyway, here's my cute little living room. And I finally got my office organized. I've got my cute little desk. And I have my little angels. These were Christmas decorations, but I love them. They're so lovely. So I've got my Jesus and my Buddha and my angels and my little turtle rocks. These, this represents me and my kids. It's from the cruise. And this is where I'm gonna sit and work today. Well, it is the evening. This fruit, I'm gonna actually chop all this fruit up and freeze it. This will be wonderful. This was from our tree. We've been eating it like crazy, but we can't quite keep up and it's starting to turn. So I'm gonna chop this up and make, oh, I'm gonna clean up the kitchen too. Uh, freeze it for smoothies. You can make banana, um, nectarine, uh, ice cream, or smoothies, or whatever. Anyway, it won't be wasted. And I'm going to have a cup of tea here. I just took my vitamins. I had my meal. It was wonderful. And... Am I gonna have sleepy mint? Do I want, I don't really want sleepy mint, but I don't want green tea. Well, maybe I will have some green tea. A little boost, it'll be a little, I hope it's not too much of a boost. It's organic. So I have some tea and I'm gonna do some editing on my book and then I'll come back and tidy up the kitchen. And I've already set dinner aside for dad. So he'll have a hot meal when he gets home. And the kitchen's a little bit erratic right now. See, we still have some of this. Plus I make cookies for the librarians. So I save some for everybody here and dad. And then I have some supper, some leftover Tuna casserole, I know it doesn't really look exciting, but once it's heated up, it's delicious. And there's salad, there's fresh organic salad in the fridge. And then I'll come back in, I'm gonna have my tea and edit, because I never got to edit today. I had a big fantasy of having my coffee and editing and listening to my music all day. And instead, I spent all day driving people around and picking people up. Okay, I'm trying to get my fan bit, okay. 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 I think that's it. So anyway, I'll clean the stove. I'll tidy up just a little bit. Load the dishwasher. We got room in there. But I won't run that till tomorrow. What other kind of tea I have? Let's see. We got that. A lot of sleepy time. I'm not really ready for sleepy time. What's this? This is cup of calm. I'm not really ready to be calm either. I'm not time. It's not time for sleepy time. And we got a lot of this stuff. Red velvet cake. That one requires hmm, more sleepy. Oh, mint magic, sleepy. What's this? Eggnog. Oh, winter tea, how fun, huh, oh well.
I know this is kind of pathetic, but that's all I have. Those are the only carrots. I have no potatoes. These are the only carrots I have. And so I'll just roast these up, use them up, and then use that seasoning. <clears throat> We're gonna put this in the oven. And these bell peppers were all from the garden. They're the, I, almost the last of them. We have some more. Wash my hands. And I'm gonna dice up these onions and I'm gonna make tortillas. We're gonna eat a lot. I'm gonna cook up a lot today. And then <clears throat> I also think I'm gonna bake some bread. I've already made a huge batch of granola bars from my, I'll show you the book I used. I love this book so much. I spent $24 on this book. I couldn't resist. Someone told me about it and I just loved it. And it came with the original cover and then it has the plastic over it to protect it. I actually have to tape this down more because I love this cover. And this is kind of what I'm aiming for. Just making all my own stuff. I just think that that's so good for our health and for our budget. So I made a bunch of granola bars. There's a mix in there and then there's, there's a granola mix and then there's a granola bar um, recipe and I just combined them. Huge pan. I am not buying granola bars or anything anymore. The more I study the ultra processed and processed foods, corporate company factory foods, the more I'm like, I'm done. 
because the regular granola bars are just loaded like a lot of oats are sprayed heavy with roundup so i bought a 25 pound bag of organic oats and i make all my own stuff so these are the granola bars and i have two packs of these frozen up in there they're delicious so i got those out and I'm gonna make some Amish white bread today because people love that and it's great for packing for lunches. And I'm gonna make, well, actually I think tomorrow I'm gonna to make the Amish bread for the school lunches because the kids love that. But today I'm gonna to make tortillas. I'm making, as you saw, so I'm baking a chicken and I only have those carrots. I do wish I had some more carrots. I love roasted carrots with the chicken fat <clears throat> drizzled on them. Oh. Anyway, and then I'm making a vegetarian Indian 13 bean soup, but I'm trying a meat masala. It does not mean that it has meat in it. It's just flavoring for a meat masala and when we made the kidney bean soup, no wait, it wasn't kidney bean, sorry. When we made the chickpea soup and we used the meat masala, it made it smell and taste like lamb. And I loved it. But I think there was something else we did. Maybe we used fresh onions or we made I sometimes will buy huge bags of these kind of onions. If I can get a huge bag really cheap, or even these, actually any kind of, if I find a huge bag of onions discounted and say, you know, they're about to turn, I will chop them up and dehydrate them and then grind them for my own onion powder. And they make, the homemade onion powder is so delicious. So using that and then- I like to mix white and wheat because you don't want to just have all white. So white and wheat, and then I put a little bit of baking soda, but I'm gonna have, and I put a little oil and then water and mix it up. But I am gonna have Bali. He makes the best tortillas and he shows me and shows me and shows me and I cannot, I can't figure it out. I just never ever can make the tortillas like he makes them. No matter how many times he shows me or I try, they just always, his turn out really fluffy and chewy and mine turn out, well, chewy, but not fluffy. My friend over here is, I'm not gonna show her house, but she's having a garage sale. She's the one I talk about all the time, has garage sales, but she did not have one this summer. She had one this spring, but not this summer. But I ran into her the other day and she said she was gonna have one and she did. And so anyway, I went to the health food store. I had to get some creamer. I got some wonderful organic grapes. And I found more of this, my shampoo. I love the shampoo. And we're trying to get away from plastic as much as possible. I get this for $3.99. Usually $4.99, but I bought three because it was $3.99. I stock up. I'm always afraid because I keep finding these wonderful products in cardboard or paper and natural products, and then they discontinue them. So I stock up big time. Anyway, I had to get some stuff at the little health food store. And then I stopped here because she was having a garage sale, but I got overwhelmed. And they said I'd be back later. And she gave me this, and then this caught my eyes. Like, I love this for my couch. And she said, just take it. 
so she just gave it to me for free. But she does that all the time because I'm like her best customer. I have bought so much stuff from her. I cannot find my keys. Where are my keys? Oh, there they are. Anyway, I'm one of her best customers. And I have all the curtains and stuff you see in my house. The nice, nice ones are hers that she sold me for cheap. And she's given me so much stuff. And then she sells me bags of stuff for cheap. And her son is older and taller and so usually I buy a ton of clothes from her for my kids. Howdy! It's not good morning because it's already afternoon but I had a garage sale today so here's the thing I made a declaration that I was going to bring things home but I also had a small clause in there and I don't know if I said that because I actually um, got rid of a lot of the stuff I put in my videos. But the clause was if I found good stuff, I was going to pass it up. And I did. So I did go to a garage sale. And I went to the lady down the street who has all the garage sales I've been going to for years. She's when I got these wonderful curtains. There's actually two of these curtains, but I only have one used. And those beautiful curtains, those have little velvet fall leaves on them. It's gorgeous linen. And then she gave me these curtains today for $5. Every time she sells me curtains are $5. And she gave me this piece of plastic. It's the office, you know, when you, some of you have worked at offices and you have this around your desk so you can roll around. And I have been so frustrated because my chair is like right on the edge. It keeps sticking on the carpet. And I thought I need a little one of those little, you know, desk, I don't know, carpet plastic pieces, whatever you call them. If you know what they're called, tell me. And, um, but I'm too cheap. I'm like, I'm not going to buy it. I'm just going to suffer with my chair getting stuck on the edge of the rug. And today I was walking Molly and... She was having a garage sale, and looky loo, and she gave it to me for free. What else did she give me? Then she gave me, yesterday she gave me this, and I don't know that I'll keep it here or like that, but I love it because it's very cozy. And then she gave me this new lamp, which is wonderful because this lamp, as lovely as it is, um, it's not working. So, I mean, it barely, barely works. So I'm thrilled. I gotta clean all this up. So there's a new lamp and that was free. And, um, and she gave me a free cushion for my bum. And then I bought stuff, I bought stuff. I bought clothes for the kids, snow pants for Sam cause he's um, has an outdoor school one day a week and rain or shine or snow, they're out there so um, I've got, I've been going through all his winter gear and making sure he has, you know, thick socks and rain gear and all that. So anyway, I got some clothes for all of us. Not that we need it, but I wanted to buy some stuff from her because she gave me so much stuff for free. Well, hello. We're going to have a little chat, but I'm going to keep it simple. going to keep it simple. Essentialism, Greg McEwen. I love this book. Greg McEwen talks a lot in this book about companies, countries, um, history, coaches of famous athletes. And you think, well, it doesn't really relate to me. I mean, me as a homemaker, it's really strange that this book would have the biggest impact and resonate so much with me, but it did. I so I read this a few years ago and I've read it. This is probably the fourth time I finally bought the book and I'm still, I mean, I've been tabbing and highlighting and going crazy. I love this book. And even though it is about corporations and, and companies and, and CEOs and coaches, and I took everything and I applied it to my life because I am my own company. I am 
the CEO and the accountant and I am running a little business and not only do I run a home but I also run my own little writing career I'm a creator for YouTube and yes I, I have a small channel but doesn't mean I don't put a lot of effort into it and I do everything with my books you know I can't afford an editor right now so I edit I proofread I write I, I'm everything I'm the writer the editor the proofreader the marketer I'm not saying I do a fantabulous job but and then um, on top of that, I manage a home and I manage a really small uh, allotment of funds. And so I have to be very wise and clever and know how to make it stretch. And today, um, I showed you the stuff I got. But anyway, today I took Molly for a long walk. Actually, Molly took me for a walk because she decided we were going to go around the back way. And so we did our big three-mile loop around town and we wound up at the garage sale. And I saw a lamp and I saw this plastic piece that I needed under my chair. I'm very excited because now I can roll around. And so I was very excited and I rushed home and I told... Bali, I said, we have to go over there because we have to take a car because there's a lamp and there's this and that. And I said, and then I got to buy a couple things from her because yesterday she gave me something free and then today. And so, you know, it's only polite to, and she gives me free stuff all the time. So I try to, I bought a lot of things from her, but I think it's equal as to what I bought from her and what she's given me. So... <clears throat> The Bali and the kids started kind of teasing me. You're always going to the garage sales. You're always bringing things home. But then you donate stuff. And, and then you just put it out in the street. And the truth is, I do bring stuff home all the time. And I clean it up. And I throw it in the washer. And I'd say about 75% of it we keep. And I built beautiful wardrobes for every, everyone in this house has an amazing wardrobe. Nice jeans and shirts and sweaters and everything. Okay, and I have a beautiful wardrobe right now. I can't even believe. And most of it's free. And I can't even believe the things I have found. And my wardrobe is just like, has so much color and patterns and prints and variety. I've never had such a nice wardrobe ever. And I didn't really pick it. I just picked stuff off the street and it's like the universe kind of built. I was thinking a while back, I only had stretch pants and a lot of t-shirts and I didn't really like how the t-shirts were cut or fit. And I, I was starting to feel kind of masculine. Like I felt like all my clothes were dark and it was always t-shirts and stretch pants. And I thought, I really want like a lovely feminine wardrobe. And I don't know, like within a year, I kept finding free stuff and bringing it home and washing it. And uh, and now I look at my closet, I'm like, look at this closet. Like, it's amazing. And there's some things I can't totally fit into yet. But I keep working out. I keep working out and I keep cleaning. My diet keeps getting healthier and healthier. And I keep exercising and slowly but surely, I'm shrinking. So, and those things are not that far off. It's not like I've got skinny jeans size two. I mean, I have things that maybe 10 pounds, you know, shrink a little bit and they'll look nice. So anyway, we have really nice wardrobes, all of us. We have an adorable house filled with wonderful things. And most of it has been free. I found it on the street or garage sales, you know, or whatever. And so I didn't really appreciate that. I'm like, yeah, I do bring a lot of things home. And yes, I do have to put things on the street. Who cares? Who cares? I've managed, I have very small funds to work with. 
okay, we aren't making a fortune here. So I have a very small income, monthly income to work with. And yet we have all this. I mean, we have a lovely, lovely home decorated. I mean, yeah, maybe it could be decorated cuter. I don't know. I think I've done a pretty good job with what I found. And so, you know, I just kind of ignore it. And I, and I remind them, I'm like, you like your house and you like your clothes and you have fun things to play with and you have good food, good meals, and you have a good life. So let mama drag things home. And then I started reading this and and here's the thing. Let me read these two things to you. Okay, so there's the non-essentialist and the essentialist. We're working towards being the essentialist, someone who has boundaries, who um, minimizes their hustles and tasks, who downsizes their life so that it's simple, humble. They have a lovely zen-like life. Non-essentialists are all over the place saying yes to everything, going here, going there. You know, we don't want to do that. Anyway, it says, when a non-essentialist, so here's a book. When a non-essentialist receives a windfall, she tends to consume it rather than to set it aside for a rainy day. We can all, we've all been guilty of that. And I've observed people in my life who, um, maybe they're self-employed, so they make a big chunk of money, but then they don't make money for a long, long, like they have dry spells. And um, there is a writer on YouTube called The Cozy Creative. She's really uh, charming. I really enjoy her channel. And she is a writer. And she talked about, she used to be with a publishing company. Now she publishes on Amazon for herself. But she talked about receiving a really huge chunk of money earlier in her years working for a publisher. And then she had to make that money last, like, I think, five years. She didn't see another penny for five years, but she made it last. So when you're an artist or self-employed, sometimes you have to take a chunk of money and make it stretch as long as you can. And I see some people who will take that chunk of money and they will just use it all up. Like, oh, there's more coming tomorrow. And then they're broke, like desperately broke, like no gas, no food, no nothing. And then, you know, they may get another chunk of money and they pay everything and they do responsible stuff, but maybe they treat themselves to a few things and then they're out again. And I do believe we need to reward ourselves and treat ourselves and go out and have some fun and and um, do special things or you'll go crazy. Because if you're just really cheap and tight and penny wise all the time, it, it wears on you. Like you do have to splurge and have some fun. But I guess it's the way you do it and when you do it. And when you're receiving chunks of money, sometimes we just have to be hardcore for a long time and until there's more of a flow. So, um, and I had a friend who wound up on hard times, like really hard times. Like this person was struggling with addiction and, and um, mental health issues and wound up living in a tent city. It just kind of, you know, her, her life just kind of went down, down, down. And then she wound up in a tent city. And at one point she had $12 to her name. I don't remember how she got it, but she somehow had $12 to her name. And she said she hung on to that $12 for like 90 days. And she used whatever like she lived in that tent. She was grateful for the cot and the sleeping bag and the pillow and the tent. And she used the industrial showers with the industrial, you know, corporate shampoo or whatever they give you over there. 
and she ate whenever they offered and she went through the free bins of clothes and put together a wardrobe for herself because it was at a point where she had nothing but the clothes on her back literally and she really like worked it but she would see other people who would get a check or food stamps or whatever and they'd run out and get McDonald's and fancy shampoo because they hated the the industrial shampoo in the showers and and they were sick of the you know the soup kitchen food and 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 you know it just it depends where do you want to be where do you want to wind up in the end and so then you have to think about your money and sometimes the smartest thing is to when you have a windfall to hang on to it for dear life now let's go on we can see an example of this in the way nations have responded to finding oil. For example, in 1980, when Britain discovered North Sea oil, the government suddenly had a massive windfall and additional tax revenues to the tune of 166, 166 billion pounds over a decade. Arguments can be made for and against how this money was used, but what is beyond contestation is that it was used. Instead of creating an endowment to prepare against unexpected disasters, such as, in hindsight, the coming Great Recession, the British government spent it in other ways. And I guess spent it all up. The way of the essentialist, on the other hand, is to use the good times to create a buffer for the bad. Now, there is a little news clip and I, I forgot what it was called. So I think America's Most Frugal Moms. And it was about these two super frugal friends. And they both worked at a certain company, but, and they were really into being frugal and they were cutting coupons and doing all this frugal stuff together. And that was like their hobby. And it paid off because at some point the company laid them both off. Now, one of them was a single mom and one of them had a husband that worked. But the, the mom that had the husband that worked, she said, it is in those prosperous times when you tighten your belt the most. So that when you're not in prosperous times, you're gonna do okay. The other woman, the single woman, bought a house, paid it off, did all her own DIY, bought all her clothes and, thrift, and furniture from thrift stores, paid for her car and, ga and cash, saved like crazy. So when she was laid off, she just took three years off to be with her kids. So there you go. So she was prepared. Okay, so let's talk about a country. Norway also benefited enormously from windfall taxes from oil, but unlike Britain, Norway invested much of its good fortune in an endowment. Today, this endowment has grown over time to be worth an extraordinary 720 billion, making it the world's largest sovereign wealth fund and providing a cushion against unknown future scenarios. Norway. Now, here's another story. I love this story and I have applied this story to my life in all kinds of ways. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Use of ex use extreme preparation. The value of extreme preparation on a grander scale can be seen in the story of, okay, I probably pronounced these names wrong. You know how I am. Just give me some grace. Roald Amundsen and Robert Falcon Scott in their race to be the first people in modern history to reach the South Pole. Both men had, and this was early, I think this was in the early 1900s, I can't remember. He talks about it again in his other book. Um, both men had exactly the same objective, but their approaches differed. Amundsen prepared for anything and everything that could possibly go wrong. Scott hoped for the best case scenario. He brought just one therm thermometer for the trip and was furious when it broke. Amundsen brought four thermometers. Scott stored one ton of food for his 17 men. Amundsen stored three tons. 
Scott stashed supplies for the return journey in one spot marked with a single flag, meaning that if he went even a fraction off course, his team could miss it. Amundsen, by contrast, planted 20 markers miles apart to ensure that his team would see it or see them. Roald Amundsen prepared diligently and read obsessively for his journey, whereas Robert Falcon Scott did the bare minimum. While Amundsen deliberately built slack and buffers into his plan, Scott hoped for the ideal circumstances. While Scott's men suffered from fatigue, hunger, and frostbite, Amundsen's team, a Amundsen's team's journey was relatively, under the circumstances, frictionless. Amundsen successfully made the journey. Scott and his team tragically died. So also, um, Greg McEwen wrote another book, a second book. It's, it's okay. I have it in ebook form and, and it's okay. But he talks further about this. And the other thing that they did is Scott would, when the weather was good, he would push his men to just absolute fatigue, beyond fatigue. And then when it stormed, they would hunker down. But by then his men were sick hungry, fatigued. Amundsen had them do only so many miles a day. He just had them do a, a little distance, an easy distance every day. He did not push them or drive them or go to exhaustion. And even when it was storming, I think that they pushed ahead. I'm not sure, but he never pushed it. He just had a nice, steady, slow pace every day whether it was nice weather or bad weather. And that way they didn't wind up fatigued or sick or anything. So this is a really good story because there's a lot of people out there um, in their work and in their finances. They work too hard. And I used to do this too. I would work two or three jobs, but I never had any money but I would become exhausted and burn out, freak out, quit my jobs, take some time off, then go get another job, two jobs, three jobs, and do it all over again. And I would try to go to school on top of that. And of course I would never finish school because I was too exhausted from working too much and I never had any money. Now, if I had just had one job, maybe a part-time job, and went to school part-time, and was really, really smart with my money, lived really small and humble, and did everything slow and steady, and was super smart with the money and frugal, I would have accomplished, I probably would have finished school, and I would have lived just fine on a smaller income, because back in my youth, rent was cheap, and you could roommate with people, and but I don't know, I was always running from things and trying to work a lot to save a lot, but then I just spend a lot trying to reward myself or comfort myself, you know, for working so much. And um, so I had this pattern. And I find that even today, like even as a grown up, even seeing this pattern and knowing that I have this, I have done it to myself several times, much to the detriment of you know, my health and happiness. And like, for example, the channel, like I've done too much. And then when something goes wrong, I freak out and I've deleted this channel a couple times. And, um, you know, just, you know, I get grumpy and tired. But over time, you know, when I started reading this book, I started really looking at that, like, you know, you keep overdoing it, overworking, but you never really get that far. It's like, if you take on too many jobs and you have that control A type personality, like I'm gonna do all these things and I can, and I'm gonna control them because only I know how to do them right and I'm gonna get it all done. You may be able to work all these jobs or all these tasks or hustles, but everything's gonna be Luke lukewarm and sooner or later if not immediately you're gonna have to say no to this to say yes to this and sometimes the thing you say no to 
is a thing that you should not be saying no to, like family time or, um, you know, resting or your mental health or, you know, your dreams or whatever. So I was thinking about, you know, today how uh, my family was kind of teasing me about, you know, bringing things home. But I feel like two things. So two th these stories really, really talk to me right now because ever since I came back from the cruise, I have had time to really reflect and do some inner work. And I have said this many times where I'm not going to work too hard and I'm not going to do too much and I'm going to really slow down and live a Zen life. But then pretty soon I start having the energy and the enthusiasm and then I start overworking. And I went on that cruise and being removed from my daily life and then being brought back into it <clears throat> caused a profound change in me. And I'm not gonna go into it because I can't even explain it. I just, something shifted. It's like I really saw clearly and I just got it. I got it, I shifted and <clears throat> I changed a whole thing. I had to get myself some more water. Anyway, I went on that wonderful, beautiful cruise that you all saw. And it was kind of life changing. It was life changing. So I came back and I found it was very hard for me to just fall back into, um, how life was and start doing all the things I was doing before. And I realized I was already starting to change and shift. You know, it's like I'm starting to go into the change of life. I'm getting older uh, and I'm just prioritizing things differently. Certain things are more important than other things. Time is really valuable. And I'm wanting to focus on what I really no, love and so I uh, I don't know kids are yelling someone's always barking or yelling so time's precious I'm getting older I'm going into the time my what the Chinese call our second spring which is you know I'm I'm probably going into pre-menopause not quite there yet. I'm in something. 54 years old. I got to be in something, I'm sure. And so I'm just like, time's precious and life's precious. And I don't want to spend it working like a dog all the time. There's times to work like a dog and save like crazy and prepare for the future. And that's what we've done, just like that book. You know, like, um, well, like Norway, we've been saving. I mean, we have paid everything off and we've been saving over time, paying off things, saving at the same time, just a little bit, little bit, but we're doing pretty good now. We're doing pretty good. <clears throat> and, and we prepared for the future in many ways. You know, it's like every time I have, every time we have money, we do what we have to. Like I said, we pay off debt, we save a little, we stock up, we plant some more fruit and nut trees, we get more tools and seeds and sustainable things like a Berkey water filter. All I've gone into that a million times, so I'm not going to bore you, but we always use, you know, when funds come in, we think, okay, how is this going to, like, how can we spend it where it'll serve us way into the future? And um, also, like Roald, Roald, Roald Amundsen, you know, um, I always, I have been reading and studying and learning and practicing 
and doing all kinds of things to create um and Bali too, you know, but I kind of, it's like, I do the investigation and then I'm like, let's do this and Bali and I do it together. So we have been doing all these things to build up a strong home and create a sanctuary and plant orchards and gardens that will feed us and attract birds and bees, which also keep our little yard ecosystem healthy. And, um, you know, it's like I, I've been hunting and, and scavenging and finding things for years and filling my pantry and decorating my home and filling our wardrobes with free things off Craigslist and off the street and hand-me-downs people give us. And I was never too proud to pull over and look through a box or, um, you know, like the other day I put and I put a lot of stuff out. I, I've been putting lots of things on the street as well as bringing things home. And I had a woman who stopped by at night and Molly, she pulled over at night and was going through my stuff. And I was so relieved because I had a lot of stuff out there. And what people don't understand is that when, you know, like everyone in our neighborhood puts stuff out on the street and we are thrilled when people pull over and go through our stuff. There is nothing more frustrating than putting stuff on the street and it stays there for days because then you get kind of stressed. You're like, oh, I mean, I can take it to a thrift store, but I don't want to throw anything away. And then there, that I have to go all the way to the thrift store. So we are thrilled when people pull over and she was a little bit and she was so thankful, but kind of embarrassed. And she said her daughter was hiding in the car. And I'm like. I said, I have filled my house with things that I found on the street. And it is a relief when I put things on the street. It's a relief when people come and get them. So don't feel embarrassed or ashamed. And I don't because I'm, you know, I am someone who um, not just scavenges off the street, but I also provide things for the street. But I have spent... You know, I mean, I know we're talking about a trip to what the North Pole. Um, they were trying to reach the race to be the first people South Pole to reach the South Pole. Okay, I'm not trying to reach the South Pole, but because I have worked with a small income through uh, almost 13 years, and I knew before, like when I was younger, and I worked all those jobs, and not only did I never save anything, but I started getting in huge debt. I bought a car, a new used car and had a loan. I went to um, a trade school, didn't even finish, but I had like a $8,000 loan for five months. I opened credit cards. So I was in huge debt by the time I was in my early third, like within two years I was in huge debt. And it took about six years or more of working three or four jobs, three jobs, two or three jobs, a uh, six, seven days a week to pay off that debt. So I have done all of that. And then I had um, a small inheritance that I went through and I lived above my means for two years and then it was all gone and I had nothing to show for it, not even a book. I, I didn't even have like nice clothes or nice furniture or a book to show for it. I just lived above my means for like two years. So I have made all the mistakes. So once I got married and I had kids, I didn't make, I started reading the complete Taiwan Gazette and all the frugal books and all the cheapskate books. And I learned every trip, tr trick and tip. And, and because of that, we saved a lot of money. We held on to that savings through years of not making much money. We were able to buy a cheap, rundown little house and fix it up and live in it. And then we were able to um, rent it out and move to a better house at a better neighborhood, not a better house, but a bit better neighborhood, a better area, better town, and then sell that house 
at the height of the market and earn a huge profit and pay off half of this house, like wise move after wise move that kind of made up for and canceled all my other bad moves. But it's because I learned after that, after making the mistakes that I made, I started learning how to be super thrifty, super frugal, not touch your savings. Once you save money, you do not touch it. You pretend like you do not have it. And that's the smartest thing. And like one woman, I, there was a comment, I don't know if it was on my channel or someone else's, but she talked about pretending to be poor. She said, I pretend to be poor and that way I always have money and I'm never in a situation. And that is very smart. And I just read the whole thing. Seneca gives advice to his friend through a letter. And he says, practice being poor sometimes so that you know what to do. If, if you lose your fortune, you'll know what to do. And you also won't be afraid of poverty. You know, you'll know that you can survive it. And sometimes it can be quite um, a creative time. And it can. And I said that to my friend the other day. I said, I love being poor sometimes or, or pretending to be poor because it brings out this real um, creative side. And it didn't really go over that well with her. She was like, <laughs> she kind of gave me that look like, oh my God, what's wrong with you? You know, and she said, I don't like it at all. I spend all this energy and bandwidth you know, just trying to figure out, you know, because <clears throat> she was in one of those situations where she was like on her last pennies and she had a gift card. She had a Safeway gift card and she had like a little bit of loose change. And she said, I was on my app. I Here I was spending like all this time on my Safeway app trying to find the deals and figure out, you know, what I could get with this small gift card and if I could also afford this big chunk of cheese and if I used this gift card, it was like a $25 gift card from Safeway, and use this plus the apps on my phone and the coupons to afford a couple things and a big thing of cheese. And she said, I spent all this time and then I was like getting irritable with my child and and there is a point, there is a point where you get too broke and it just sucks up your energy and your time and you go to bed worried and you don't sleep well and you have, you're stressed in your days. But, and that's why, and I've been there. I've been there where I only had $20 and it was like, that's way back when I had Clyde and I was single and I had $20 and I needed groceries for the week and Clyde needed dog food for the week. And it was like, how am I gonna do it? Or actually I had cats and I had Clyde. Clyde had food, but I needed cat food and I needed food for me. And I was like, how am I gonna afford cat food for the week and food for me for the week? And I did it, I managed, but it's like, yeah. It's, I mean, when you're at that point where <clears throat> you're so broke, um, you know, you have no savings, you know, you have nothing to fall back on and you're just kind of constantly, you know, working with your last pennies. It is exhausting and stressful and it's not fun. So that's why when um, and that was towards the end, right before I got married. And I was really like, I had gone through my whole inheritance. I didn't have any debt. I had paid off all my debt before I inherited the money. And then I inherited some money and lived off that. I worked, but I worked part-time jobs and I lived in nice little houses. And I um, lived above my means for over two years. And so by the time, then I ran out of money and sometimes I had roommates and that worked out well, but I didn't make a lot of money. I was making $9 an hour. I was working part-time and then I was working full-time. I was working part-time for $20 an hour and then I moved to Living Light and I was working part-time, no, full-time for $9 an hour. 
So my rent was $1,200 and I brought home $1,300 a month. <laughs> so I had roommates and that helped with the utilities and not much else. And I didn't even know anything about like, um, I didn't know anything about um, Medicare or Cal or, I always get it mixed up, but Medicare or food stamps or food banks, I knew nothing about any of that. So I just struggled and struggled and struggled. And so when I got married, and I got pregnant, we started saving like crazy. And then I went on and, and then things happened. Bali's job went out of business. I started a daycare, then we moved. We lived off nothing. And I studied like Emmonson. I studied because I did not want to go back to work. Bali didn't want me to go back to work. You've seen, we lived over in Walnut Grove. There was nowhere to work. It was, a, there were 700 people there. There was no, we had one car. I was home with two babies. There was no way I could work. It would have been so much stress and not worth it for me to work outside the home. And I would have had to travel to go work. So, um, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave the home. I didn't want to leave my kids. I was nursing. I was super into being a mom. So I learned. I read every book I could get my hand on. I learned everything I could about saving money and having an envelope and getting free firewood and hanging my clothes out, making laundry detergent and baking bread. I did it, tried it, everything. And we did fine. We were very comfortable and we did just fine. And then I was inspired and then I I moved us, I encouraged us to move to a smaller house with less rent, less utilities, less commute. And so because I learned everything I could and I prepared and prepared and prepared and started doing things like stocking a pan, like I got better and better. So we moved and we reduced our costs and our commute. And then I started writing and it was something that gave me a lot of joy and I didn't know if I'd make money or not. But it turned out it did make money. And then we bought a house. And our mortgage was even cheaper than our rent. It was cheaper than any rent we had ever paid. It was like $900. And then the commute was only like a mile. <clears throat> and then I started really learning how to... I had this woman, Granny, live with us. And she helped me. She encouraged me to get chickens and put in a winter garden and watch all these channels about homesteading and taught me how to make the Amish white bread and said, bake all your bread, learn how to can, can, you know, do all this stuff. And so then I started really, really going for it and started getting better and better and started stocking a pantry, growing food, canning jams and spaghetti sauces and dilly beans and and hanging our clothes out all the time and I did try home detergent and did, I'm not into it I tried making everything and I'm the one thing that never worked was the home detergent but um I just kept learning and learning and improving and with that life got easier and easier and money became more abundant because we needed less and less. And so we could save more and more. And thus our life, our quality of our life improved. And then here we are. Because of all of that, here we are. And our mortgage, unfortunately, is, you know, a lot higher than that little blue house. But it's only about $150 more than the average rent we used to pay. We used to always have rent that was about twelve, thirteen hundred dollars. We pay fourteen fifty, so that's how I sum it. I'm like, it's one hundred and fifty dollars more than rent. When in a time when we used to make a lot less money, and I had no writing career, no YouTube, no way of making extra money, and back then I didn't use the food banks or anything, and. Um,
you know, so I've gotten even more. And no, we are not using the food banks anymore at all. We aren't. I volunteer now. I do not use it. Because I thought about it and I'm like, you know, there was a time when we made less than we make now. And we paid about the same rent. Plus our utilities were higher. Like we had propane on the ranch and everything. And, and we never use food banks or food stamps or anything. And so I just thought... You don't need that. Plus, I feel like the food banks here, I feel like this one's kind of struggling a little bit. Like they need volunteers, they need donations, they need money. So, and I always said, if I felt like we were a burden, we would not. And and I do agree. You, if, if there are people who really, really, really need it. And <clears throat> I'm pretty good with money. So I don't, we don't, I can figure it out just fine. And... I also, you know, now that I'm back at YouTube, it's like, there's my grocery money. Anyway, um, it's all in just being smart. I mean, I know inflation, everybody keeps talking about inflation, but honestly, I shop at the grocery outlet in Winco and I do not spend that much on groceries these days, especially because I buy everything in bulk. I just buy bulk and produce and I make everything from scratch. And so I feel like I have the lowest, even though my kids are growing and they're big eaters, I feel like I have such a small grocery budget. Or I mean, I feel like I have a very small grocery bill these days, I really do. Anyway, so like those, let me get back on track. Like Amundsen, I started learning everything I could learn and I started practicing all the tips and tricks I was learning from all these frugalistas and thrifty people. And I started downsizing and downsizing and downsizing. And I started doing that again recently. And when we do have windfalls, we hang on to them. And we spend them on things that will help us grow our windfalls. Like when we plant fruit and nut trees, that means that now we have lots of organic produce. We don't have to buy that at the health food store. That saves us hundreds of dollars. When we grow gardens, we save a fortune in produce and canned goods. You know, I mean, we're starting to. It's taken a while, but we're starting to. So... There's my advice. I have people who constantly ask me, you know, how do I reduce my budget? How do I live super frugal? Tell me what to do. And I think these two stories are very clear. You know, when you have money, use it to buy things that will save you money in the future. Say cloth diapers, Birkin water filters, learn to grow a garden, buy the seeds and the whatever you need to do the garden or plant a few fruit trees if you're in a good zone, you know, and educate yourself, educate yourself on how to be frugal and how to garden and how to can and how to manage your money. And I mean, I've read everything from, you know, books on finances to books on frugality to books on gardening to books on, you know, how to make money from home and and that is how, because the thing is, we don't, um, I have a very small income to work with every month, but if you educate yourself and you learn all kinds of tips and tricks, you can, like Amy Decision said, you can either go get a job outside of home or you can learn how to save. And so the more you learn how to be smart with your money and save and be frugal, then, you know, you actually save money because working out there actually costs a lot. There's daycare, there's gas or bus tickets. And wear and tear on your car and clothing and then, you know, things like eating out, you know, it just goes on and on and on. And sometimes some people found after paying taxes and this and that, that in the end, they were only really earning 50 cents an hour. 
you know, by the time they paid for all the expenses to go to work. So, um, you know, if you want to stay home or whatever, just like do what they did. So I love these stories. And also slow and steady wins a race. Like Scott really drove his men and Amundsen didn't. And also, you know, it says here, like Amundsen brought four thermometers. Scott brought one. Scott stored one ton of food. Amundsen stored three tons. And I do that whenever I have money. I mean, I really am stuck in my pantry like crazy right now. Because if something happens, or if say I want to really focus on writing a book, and I slow down on YouTube, I don't have to worry about grocery money. My chest freezer and my pantry is really, really stocked. My toiletries and cleaning supplies are super stocked. Like every time I have extra money, I buy extra this and extra that, extra bars of shampoo, extra boxes of detergent. And so I'm slowly stocking up and stocking up so that if there's a time when I'm not making that many royalties and I'm not want, I'm not on YouTube that much, you know, because I'm focusing on trying to get books out. I don't have to worry. I'm like, we have enough soap to last for months. I have enough laundry detergent right now to get us through probably a few months, you know. <clears throat> and I always get extra stuff. I'm not, when I am decluttering, I'm not decluttering like important things like cookbooks and extra kitchen. I have extra kitchen gadgets. I do not give them away. I have extra stuff because I need extra stuff. I cook a lot. So I need all the tools and everything. And, um, oh, I gotta tell. Wait, I think that's enough for today. I hope you enjoyed those two readings and I hope they inspired you. I feel like I have a little hair floating in my nose. I probably do. All right. I hope that inspired you. And, um, you know, if you're struggling financially or you want to be more frugal or whatever, read the books, watch the channels, read, find the blogs and do everything that the wise men and women of frugality teach you to do. Also, um, I am not going to write any more frugal books, at least for a long time. I have a couple. Let me show you. My last two that I wrote, and I love so much. I wrote this one, all the changes from my front porch. This was over a year's worth of work, and it was during a time when we were sort of, not completely, but sort of unplugged. And we were, you know, I was really, I wasn't working as much on my right, I didn't write for over a year. I didn't publish for over a year. I wrote, I worked on this for over a year, but I used to crank out a book like every two, three months I had a book out. And I just stopped and I was really slowing down and I was kind of unplugging. I got rid of the internet from the house, but we still had access here and there. And I was really downsizing and simplifying our life and trying to create this like Zen-like sanctuary home and and unplug from the outside world and the internet and find this inner peace and, and you know, cook more from scratch and be more frugal and humble and <clears throat> and it was actually a really beautiful time and I have a lot of books and movies and things in here that inspired me to live this life and reflect on it and homemaking as a spiritual practice and living frugally and on less money as a more creative outlet. I mean, it really does induce creativity because you have to be creative to live off very little. And so I really, this was a beautiful book and I tried to write another one and I have nothing but fond memories about this. And I tried to write another one and I just couldn't. I just, I was trying to edit it yesterday. I just can't, I've tried over and over to write it. It's just not that this was just kind of like that once 
and I mean, maybe down the road, but this was just one of those things that it just was natural. It was organic and lovely and I cannot recreate it. And then this is the one I did this year, A Feast of Life. And this, I was inspired. I was cleaning the bathroom one day and I was inspired. I just saw this book and I was like, I'm just gonna write one more frugal book. And I had a lot of fun with this. I put pictures in there. Oh my goodness, I had all kinds of pictures. And that's a weird picture, hold on. I put all kinds of pictures and, and then I did this magazine style. And the only reason why I did magazine style is because, well, I couldn't figure out how to format the pictures to fit in a smaller book. So I'm like, well, we'll go with the eight by 11. But it turned out really fun. Like I just picked fun pictures and played with it and people loved it. Um, and this was, this was inspired and written with a lot of joy, but I'm not there anymore. I just, you know, I went on the cruise and I came back and I'm like, I just like, I feel different. I feel different. I feel older and more mature and more like time's precious, life's precious. And I don't want to focus so much on, I don't want to write about frugality and homemaking anymore. I have loved it for 13 years. I have been so in love with homemaking and frugality and it's gotten us so far and it's created this wonderful life. And now I can stay home and I can be with my kids and I can write my books. However, that time is passing now where um, I just, I've written since 2015. So for almost 10 years now, I have been writing about frugality and homemaking. And if you look underneath the video, in the description, they don't have a description box anymore, but you'll see, you hit more, you'll see something and hit more. You'll see, you can join me on Goodreads and you also see my author's page. It says my author page. And if you click on that, you will see all the books I've written in the last almost 10 years. And there's every kind of frugal book you can imagine. So <clears throat> that's all I can afford offer you. I am not going to write any more of these books. I am maybe down the road. I won't say never because I don't know. I may be suddenly inspired one day as I'm gardening and write another one. But right now it's not there. It's just I don't have it in me anymore for now. So those are my books and there's lots of other ones. And I, I apologize, but I'm not going to be writing anymore. I'm actually deep in my fiction again. I'm reading fictional books. I'm writing fictional books. I'm working on a book now. I'm thinking about maybe a series. I'm watching a lot of author tube. I'm watching a lot of channels about being an artist and a writer. And it's very fun. Like, so for years, I... I was, you know, I read frugal blogs and I watched frugal and homemaking channels and I wrote about it and I had my own channel about homemaking and frugality and I wrote tons of books and I was so in it and immersed and I loved it so much. And now I'm done. I'm kind of bored with it. And so now I'm starting to immerse myself in the artist's life. Like, what is it to be, what's it like to really be an artist and a creator of art, meaning writing? And I'm starting to color and draw and sketch. And I'm starting to watch all these channels about these artists. And um, I'm starting to... Uh, I'll show you the books. I'm starting to study the philosophers and the writers. And so I've got Seneca. Although, you know, and I'm not going to read the whole book. That is a big old mammoth book. I'm not going to read it. And then I have Breakfast with Seneca, which I'll probably more like read that because it seems more. Um, pep Talks for Writers. 
but I'm not gonna actually, this is the guy who, this is one of the guys, um, executive director of National Novel Writing Month, which I always get involved with NaNoWriMo. And I do the spring and summer camps, virtual camps. And I don't always finish them, but I still love them. I have a, a good time. Um, this is a mystery thriller, and people said it was really good. The kind worth killing. So we'll see. It might be a little too twisted for me. And then there's another one, Sometimes I Lie. And this one's supposed to be pretty good, too. So I'm going to, and I ordered another, um, I read that book about the shipwreck, The Wager, the ship that went out in the 1700s and they all got stranded on an island. Oh, that was a good book, but heavy. So I have ordered some more ship, old ship disaster books. <laughs> and, and I'm also reading Ray Bradbury's Zen of the Art of Writing. And Ray Bradbury is just... Um, a well-known writer. <clears throat> a lot of his books have turned into movies. So that's where I'm at. I'm just trying, I'm just going into a whole nother field and I'm having so much fun and I'm really diving into like the creative mind and reading and thought and, um, you know, doing some actual artwork, not just writing, but artwork and I did get rid of the TV. I packed it away for a while. I will bring it back eventually. Definitely by Halloween. Sam's like, oh my goodness, is it coming back by Halloween? Yes, I'm bringing the TV back by Halloween. But I wanted to remove it for a while and the house is filled with music now and everybody's busy you know, they're reading and talking and cooking and they still have their computer on the weekend. And so we're all busy. It's good. And I'm writing and I'm being creative and I'm reading. And so I'm like less being online and no TV and more reading. More re and it works. It works. I'm reading a lot now and I'm writing a lot now. So that's where I'm at. And I'm just, you know, working on my health and my, you know, meditating. I'm trying to meditate as often as I can and go for walks with the kids. Well, Sam, <clears throat> Sam loves to walk. Mariah doesn't like to go to the woods, but going into the wood, going for walks with Molly or Sam or both and forest bathing and just slowing down just really slowing down and, you know, taking time to stare out the window and watch the birds or just kind of pay attention to the breeze or, or as, this, you know, watching the seasons kind of change and feeling the air, the crispness in the air. And I don't know, something happened to me on that cruise ship. I'm telling you. Something happened. I came back and I'm like, this has been a wonderful life. And now we're going to try a bunch of new things. We're going to put all this away, you know, on a shelf. And we're going to try some new stuff. And we're going to explore some new areas. <clears throat> so anyway, I'll see you next Sunday. Bye. I'm making, I'm making some Amish bread. <sighs> We've been eat. oh my goodness, we made so much stuff. Yesterday I made, you saw, and here's the leftovers. But what I wanted to show you is this adorable. This was actually to keep fireplace ash, but uh, I didn't know what else to use it for. So I'm gonna use it for recycling. I won't put garbage garbage, but just recycling because it's so cute. I want to have it out. I think I'll turn it around. So there, there we go.